One, good evening. Welcome, we're glad you're here. Welcome to those who are gathered here in person at Holy Blossom and welcome to those who are joining us from near and far through the wonders of technology. A special welcome to the family and friends, congregants and colleagues of Rabbi Mark Do Shapiro, Allah HaShalom. We acknowledge that Holy Blossom Temple is hosted on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Haudenosaunee, the Ojibwe Chippewa, and the Wendat peoples. Under the dish with one spoon and the two Rawampat belt covenant, many indigenous nations agreed to peaceably share and care for the land and welcomed others to do the same. This land is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples from across Turtle Island. Tonight is the 84th anniversary of Kristallnacht, the night of shattered glass, when 30,000 Jews were arrested and 267 synagogues were burned. It is fitting to mark this dark night of history by gathering in a synagogue, a vibrant, beautiful synagogue. It is fitting to mark this dark night of history by gathering together with fellow Jews, by learning from one another, by learning from leading rabbis, by considering together what is Jewish spirituality and what is the source of strength which drives the Jewish spirit. Those beautiful and historic synagogues were not only constructed as architectural masterpieces in praise of God, but also as a faithful expression of the human spirit. And so we remember all that was lost and all that is ours to carry forward. Tonight is the second annual lecture of uh, this lecture series in memory of Rabbi Mark Dov Shapiro. And I know Mark was beloved by many in this room who knew him better than I do, but I do remember him well because he was the kind of rabbi who made himself known to other rabbis, including younger rabbis, because he loved to mentor and to encourage, and I was lucky enough to be one of those younger rabbis um, that he would seek out at conventions and he would encourage me to find my way here at Holy Blossom. Mark served as rabbi of Holy Blossom Temple from 1977 to 1982. He went on to serve the congregation in White Plains and then Temple Sinai of Springfield, Massachusetts from 1988 to the year 2016. Rabbi Mark Dov Shapiro was dedicated to the fullness of the rabbinate and lifelong learning, interfaith work. He was loved as a storyteller. Social justice work was at the center of his rabbinate. In 2007, he was honored by the National Conference for Community and Justice with its annual Human Rights Award as just one example. And among the CCAR, the Central Conference for American Rabbis, he was known as one who loved rabbis so much that he made it part of his rabbinate to be there for other rabbis. He was on the programming committees from 1996 to 2004 and made those rabbinic conventions um, really a, a place for our own lifelong learning in addition to friendship. 
And Rabbi Shapiro's publications include a book entitled Gates of Shabbat and many articles. And I'm going to name just some of the titles of the articles because then you'll be able to see why Rabbi Professor Larry Hoffman is a perfect match for this lecture in particular in memory of Rabbi Shapiro because he was interested in and devoted to so much of what Rabbi Hoffman teaches. His articles, some of them were defining our religious message and rooting the religion of freedom in history, an assessment of American Reform Judaism, and the unfolding of comfort, a commentary on the Haftarah cycle, and becoming Jewish through the Jewish information class, and the second book of Jeremiah, From Doom to Destiny. And finally, I want to lift up one of Rabbi Shapiro's contributions that went really across North America through the reform movement, something that he called the God Survey. What's the best way to honor a rabbi by teaching his Torah? So allow me just another moment or two so that you can hear Rabbi Shapiro's words about why he chose this God survey, first for his own congregation and then as um, a national experiment or a North American-wide experiment. I've always wondered about God. To tell the truth, I became a rabbi not because I had all the answers about God, but in part because questions about faith and meaning in life pressed me with special force. My dad was a physician. In high school, I considered medicine for my life's work and took all the chemistry, biology, and physics courses expected of me for a, a pre-med college track. But toward the end of my senior year, I realized I was less interested in how an atom worked than why there was an atom to begin with. Questions about why we are here and the purpose of life tilted me away from science and towards religion and inquiries about faith. Such, such questions have remained with me, and I think they are shared by many adult Jews to ponder whether there is a God and what that God does or does not do. Last Yom Kippur, I set out to explore these questions with my congregation, Sinai Temple in Springfield, Massachusetts. Before the singing of Kol Nidre, I spoke about the challenge of faith and then asked my congregants if they would help me complete my sermon. Up until now, I explained, this conversation has been one-sided. You have heard me speak about my ideas of God, but I haven't heard from you, and you haven't heard from each other. So let's remedy that on Sunday morning, when I hope you will talk to me via a survey on God and belief. Read your New York Times or whatever Sunday paper you wish, but take 10 minutes as well to complete this survey. On the day after Yom Kippur, every temple member received a computer questionnaire and, that I had designed with the help of several congregants. And over the course of the next few weeks, 338 congregants, that is 40% of the congregation, completed the God survey. And their responses revealed a great deal. You can read this article in full um, on the URJ website. And I think you will find that Rabbi Shapiro's questions prompted uh, the questions of the spirit, not only of belief and faith, but also what is it that drives us as human beings? What is it that drives us as Jews? And so it is in um, the spirit of his good teaching and his questioning mind that we gather for our learning tonight. It is my pleasure to invite Marsha Shapiro to say a few words of memory. Hi, good evening, everyone. On behalf of Mark's family, friends, and colleagues, I welcome you to this second annual lecture honoring my late husband, Rabbi Mark Dov Shapiro. I'm grateful to Rabbi Splansky and to Holy Blossom Temple for hosting this lecture series and to our family and Mark's many friends and colleagues whose generous sponsorship has made this possible. Many of you who knew Mark well knew that the foundation of his rabbinate was teaching and learning. He was a passionate teacher who strove to make educational opportunities available to adults and to children. 
And he also loved nothing more than learning new ideas, new skills, new thoughts. Among the many fulfilling and enriching experiences Mark had as a congregational and community rabbi was participating in the Greater Springfield Interfaith Community. For many years, Mark created and taught an interfaith seminar to leaders of all faiths on a myriad of topics. He loved the research, he loved the teaching, and his efforts were rewarded with a warm and grateful clergy response. Last week, Rabbi Amy Walk of Springfield took over the mantle and inaugurated the first annual interfaith lecture series in memory of Mark, and the Israeli educator, Rachel Korazin, was the first speaker. As we have heard in our tradition, the teacher is the central pillar of Jewish living. We do not celebrate kings and heroes, we celebrate teachers. Thank you to Professor Hoffman for sharing your teaching. I know that we all look forward to learning from you. And thank you again to Holy Blossom Temple for hosting this series in Toronto, which for us will always feel like home. As a close friend of Rabbi Mark Dov Shapiro and Marsha and Daniel, it's uh, my welcome duty to introduce our speaker in this second of the series of lectures uh, in memory of Mark. And I can't help but hear Mark's whistling uh, uh, near the back of the room, as he would often do. In order to introduce Rabbi Hoffman, I could go through a long list of his credentials as a professor, as a scholar, as a community leader, but you can read all of that for yourselves. What I'd rather do is share with you some personal encounters that I've had with Rabbi Hoffman over the years. Uh, I first met Rabbi Hoffman uh, at Hebrew Union College. Uh, he was a doctoral student at the time, and he taught the course uh, in Jewish liturgy. Uh, I looked over my notes to that course, which I've kept uh, uh, earlier today, and it just reminded me how Rabbi Hoffman just instilled in us a deep appreciation and a deep love for the prayers and words of our, of our rabbinic ancestors, while at the same time encouraging us to adapt those words and prayers uh, within our own congregations. And that's, that was an ongoing challenge ever since then. Anyway, after ordination, the years went by, and then Cheryl and I attended a uh, conference, a uh, convention of the uh, URJ. I'm guessing uh, several of you were probably there as well. And to my surprise, I looked up on the stage and I saw this normally modest, mild-mannered man waving his arms wildly and speaking like an evangelical preacher <laughs> about Synagogue 2000 an organization that really engendered a revolution in synagogue life, a revolution that many congregations are now engaged in and other congregations have yet to encounter, but hopefully they will. So even then, Rabbi Hoffman never stood still or stood on his merits and he continued to write and to teach. And uh, it was a privilege to keep up with all of his teachings. And uh, then he invited me to contribute some essays to his series of books on uh, Jewish prayer, which are, are readily available uh, probably in, in your library as well. And so we continue to meet either uh, on the phone or uh, in person or through correspondence. But to me, I guess one of the more intimate ways we met was through, uh, I was a member of a list of emails that he addressed to my students and they're always well worth reading. Tonight, my friends, we shall all be students of a man, a teacher, and a lecturer, and a mensch. A man who is, I suggest, without any exaggeration, one of the Gedole Hador, one of the greatest luminaries of our generation. Ladies and gentlemen, Rabbi Lawrence Hawley. You know, whenever I'm introduced so, so beautifully, um, I think to myself, back when I was younger and my kids were little, 
and I would get introduced as a luminary, <laughs> and I would think immediately, why weren't my kids here to hear that? <laughs> um, that's beautiful. Thank you for the lovely introduction. It's worth coming just to be introduced. Um, um, thanks to to uh, yeah, A.L. Slancy, one of the great rabbis of our time. And uh, I, I can't tell you how honored I am to be in this place and see what you and your colleagues and your congregants have built. And it does my heart good to see it. It's magnificent. This is my home. I mean, whenever the plane hits the tarmac here, I feel like I'm home. And I'm, I'm so glad to be here, to be sure. But especially I'm glad this time because of the man who we are on. I actually was his teacher before anybody else. He was my student when I was in college here at the University of Toronto. And Mark was in eighth grade. And it, I taught him at Temple Sinai. And already, he had this bright face curiosity. He was interested in the whole world. Now, if you think about eighth grade boys in religious school, bright eyed curiosity about the universe in religious school isn't the first thing that comes to mind. <laughs> But I got through that year because he was like that. And later when he became a rabbi, I, I knew that he was doing the right thing. Then he became my neighbor. And we had many conversations. Mark retained, I think, this awe of the universe. I mean, he always wanted to learn something new. Not a day would go by if we would meet. It's not like we saw each other every day. I mean, you know, New Yorkers never see each other ever. So. Uh, once in a while, we ran into one another or something. And he'd always have a question. He would have a suggestion. And he really wanted to know. And he would just look at me with this, hey, what do you think of this? Um, the world was alive, and our tradition was alive. And uh, he died far too soon. And we lost a great teacher, a great, a great man great rabbi. So to be invited now to do credit to him uh, is, is an honor indeed. I thought since Marx was interested, see what I'm doing? This is pretty good, right? Uh, yeah, um, I thought since Mark was, was interested in, uh, it, as they say, in this curiosity of the world, he had a deep spirituality about it. I would talk about Jewish spirituality. And there's a story, of course, that comes with it. Namely, years ago, I was, last century, I can say that it wasn't so long ago, it feels like two centuries, I was at the University of Notre Dame teaching. And I had spent a whole week teaching the theology department about Passover Seder. And at the fifth lecture or something, a public lecture it was in the library and a large crowd gathered, and I gave what I thought was a terrific talk. And in the back somewhere, one woman put her hand up and said, Dr. Hoffman, you've given five or six lectures. I've come to every one of them. But I noticed that you haven't said a single word about the spirituality of the Passover Seder. Would you like to say a few words about that? And I thought the honest answer is no. <laughs> Mainly, I didn't know what she was talking about. Back then, no Jews ever talked about spirituality. It was not a word we used. I had no idea what she was talking about. And I fumbled something or other out. And afterwards, I went to the faculty club with her and at midnight over beer or something, she is explaining to me Catholic theology, Catholic spirituality. I also didn't understand any of that. But I knew it was deep. That I could tell. And I thought, surely we've got something like this. She was on fire with it. And I could see that it was a personal relationship that it wasn't just a tradition out here, and she was like kind of looking at it from afar. She jumped in with all she was worth, and there was something deep about the way she approached her tradition. And I decided I was going to try and learn it. So I spent a good 25 or 30 years thinking about the subject, and slowly but surely, getting to know something. I think there is Jewish spirituality, and I want to talk about it today. But what is spirituality to start with? The word can be used all sorts of things. So comes another story. 
I was in the Detroit airport once on my way to or from some lecture, I think two, and uh, connecting flights in Detroit. This is in the days when the Detroit airport was not like it is now. Some of you may remember the old Detroit airport. So it looked like a bowling alley with a lot of people in it as the pins. And so a very narrow thing, and off to the side, there were these places where you waited, you know, to get your flight. So fog had set in, and it wasn't quite clear whether I would get my connecting flight. Now, when you're in like that, of course, you know what it's like to start conversations with people. So there's a woman sitting next to me, and she says, hi. Hi, say I. She says, uh-huh. It's uh, nice to see you here, I, though I guess you'd rather be where you're supposed to go. I say, yep. <laughs> So what do you do, she says. Hmm. Something about her made me think I shouldn't say I'm a rabbi. <laughs> so I said, I'm a teacher. I wouldn't lie, you know. As I said, it occurred to me that for all I know, I say to her, this is true. The next question is, what do you do? She says, I'm a teacher too. I thought to myself, maybe she's also a rabbi, not <laughs> Anyway, as I'm thinking about this, she says to me, you're going to make your flight. How do you know? I said, she says, the aura. Aura? <laughs> yes, she says, you've got a blue aura over your head. Uh-huh. <laughs> Everybody has an aura, she explains to me. I won't bore you with the details, but out comes a theology of aura. And she tells me the blue is good. That beforehand, she was noticing some red that would not be good. My plane is going to crash, but it's all blue now. Have a good flight. And then she says, as I get up to get on my flight, she says, I know this because I'm a very spiritual person. I want to tell you that's not spirituality, not by me. I have many other stories of what spirituality is not. If I give them all, you'll never get to what it is. And I want to get to what it is. So I want to think through with you, what is serious Jewish, Jewish spirituality? Now, there is a kind of spirituality that people regularly do. Meditation, you know, uh, going into the woods and just meditating, kind of, kind of uh, yoga. I have no objection to any of that. So I'm not going to talk about it. That means you shouldn't stop doing it. Um, if it, if it, you find spirituality that way, good for you. I want to talk about a different kind of spirituality, though. That spirituality is, if you like, spirituality for Jews and everybody else. I want to talk not about spirituality for Jews, but Jewish spirituality, something that arises deep out of what, what Judaism actually is. Just our regular practices. Think of our practices and what we do as tips of an iceberg. We live above the surface. So we pray, we visit Israel, we do a variety of different things. These are the tips of an iceberg. But below the surface, they're all connected into a very deep Jewish way of understanding the universe, understanding life and the human condition. I want to get below the surface with you. Take a deep dive below what we all do anyway and say, if you study it long enough, you can see that below the surface is this deep seriousness about what it is to be alive, and how to relate to God, the universe, our human beings, other human beings. And that's where I want to go. It's kind of, here I stand as a Jew, a deeply committed Jew, but not just because I do it by habit, but I'm intentional about it. And being intentional, what can I learn about the uniqueness of the Jewish psyche, the Jewish tradition? I'm going to start with, um, well, I got another story. I got a lot of stories. Every time, every time I start something else, there's a story. First kind of spirituality comes out of this story. The story I learned from my father. Obviously, he was helping me prepare for this lecture some 60, 70 years ago. Because um, it was a stupid joke that I've remembered. But now it works. So here's the stupid joke. And you'll get my point in a minute. Someone's crossing the border. And as they cross the border, uh, the person's on a bicycle. They take the bicycle across the border. The next day, same fellow's driving a bicycle across the border. The border guard notices this, of course, and she says, something's wrong here. Nobody crosses the border every single day with a bicycle. 
And so she figures out something's being smuggled. But what is it? She looks in the handlebars. Nope, nothing there. Maybe the next day she looks at the spokes, the probably gold spokes or something. Nothing. Ah, what's in the fire? She figures out next week. Nothing. Finally, she retires. She goes across the border and she waits for the bicycler to arrive. When the cyclist arrives, she stops him and she says, I know you're smuggling, but I don't know what it is. It's killing me. I'm, a, I'm retired. I can't hurt you anymore. Tell me, what are you smuggling? And she says, of course, it's simple. Bicycles. <laughs> now, why I like that story, see, is that, hold on a minute. All right, here we go. Everyone, so I'll go back and remember what I'm supposed to talk about. But meanwhile, so why I like that story is that in Judaism too, there are bicycles. Things we take for granted, but never notice because we do them every day. You just stop and you look at it, you realize there's something there. The bicycle in Judaism is called blessings, brachot, brachas. You know the same memory I had? One of my grandmother saying, Maha Bracha, say a blessing. And when you think about it, we all know, you know, we know what blessings are. Blessings are what we do. We have brachas for everything. Johnny Agnon, our great poet laureate, uh, was, got, the, got the Nobel Prize, and he tells a story about how he was prepared to get the award. Uh, he was told, you know, you have to walk and so down the aisle, and you get awarded by the king or the queen. You, you know, you sort of bow like this, then you walk back to reception, sort you know, of like the Amida, and then you turn around and you walk out, but you don't talk. Meanwhile, there's a television everywhere, and people are watching this little Jew, and he gets up there. What is he doing? He sees the king he talks. <laughs> Someone says to him, You're not supposed to do that. Are you talking to the king? And he says, yes, I was, but not that king. I was talking to that king. He says, all my life I've tried to memorize the blessing because there's a blessing for seeing royalty. And so I got to say it. <laughs> there was something about blessings. You say blessings over absolutely everything, it seems. I actually memorized the one for royalty. I thought, just in case. <laughs> I must say, I you don't have high hopes. But at any rate, blessings. They're the Jewish bicycle. Um, blessings are so important because they carry with it great, great baggage. Uh, to get to it, I'm going to have to give you a, some technical liturgy lesson here. Um, you, you won't have any trouble with these two technical terms. Blessings come in two forms. They are called, ready, long and short. The short ones are these one-liners. Brachalan and Malchalam, the Hebrew word, and after that, Amoshi Lachaminar, or Shekichang and Sultan, the Hadlik Ner Shel Shabbat, or Parade Tree, whatever it is, round. You gotta figure out what you're reading, right? But whatever it is, without these blessings, and we know all of them, Shachianu, Bakimanu, right? Think of how much Jewish life is accompanied by that. You can't see the table without doing it. What you don't realize so easily is that the prayer book too is full of blessings, but they're the long ones. Most of rabbinic prayer is these baruch things, but they're long essays. So the long ones are like theological essays. When you get up in the morning before the Shema, you say, you thank God for creating life. And that's a blessing. Before you talk about how much we love God, that you know, you should love Adonai your God. There's a blessing about how God loves us. So our prayer book is filled with these. You can't get very far in Judaism if you don't notice that there are blessings. So what's below the surface of the blessing? The answer to that is that uh, in Jewish uh, halakha, um, there's, a, there's a halakha for when the temple still stood that you're allowed to, and in fact encouraged, to give things to the priests who, who, who staff the temple. When you give things to the priests, what you give, because they're called Kodesh, so when you give things to the temple, it's called Hekdesh, the same root, Kedasha, right? So Hekdesh. Now, the thing about this, however, is once you give it, you can't get it back. My grandmother on my father's side 
Uh, you say you and grandfather, they, they used to keep chickens in their backyard. I remember as a child. And every Shabbos, they would send my father to the showcase with the chicken, kill the chicken, and then they make it for Shabbos. So I'm picturing, imagine if the temple was around and my grandmother decided to give the, to give the chick, her chickens to the poor priests who had the temple around the corner, let's just say. What if she decided to give all the chickens except one that she needed for Shabbos? And wouldn't you know it, just when she gets back, she opens the door and the last chicken flies away. And she says, wait a minute, wait a minute. And she runs to the temple and says, give me back one of my chickens. They would say, can't. Once it's ours, can't be yours. Because when you give it to us, it's like giving it to God. There's actually a sin. If you use that heck day stuff for the temple, and you're not one of the priests, you're not allowed to do it. It's a sin called an ilah. All right. So the rabbi now look at two verses in the Bible. One of them says, the entire universe belongs to God. The other one says, God has given the universe to human beings. So they ask him to call them which one's right? The answer, of course, in advance is they're both right, because you can't have anything wrong. But how do you make sense of this? And guess what they answer? The answer, the whole universe belongs to God like hectares. You can't use it until you make a blessing over it. And then it belongs to you. This is just the opposite of what people think. The blessing doesn't make something more sacred. And actually removes it from its sacred quality so that we can use it. Now that's profound when you think about it. In fact, the blessings over food insist on telling us where it's from. You may not, in other words, the ethic of all this, you may not ravage the universe. This is a Jewish ecology. You can use the universe, but only if you acknowledge where it comes from and think about it and say, well, this is from trees, uh-huh. Or even to see something in the sky, you see a lightning. You quickly say a blessing, like, who am I to enjoy the grandeur of the universe? So the first kind of spirituality and spirituality of blessing is simply the spirituality of acknowledging the universe and realizing you can't just misuse it you can't do that this then is the spirituality of ecology of ecology and it runs very very deep all right let's try another one israel well, we just had an election of israel i'm not going to talk about the politics of it that's another story uh, i want to talk about the jewish love affair with israel because it has been a love affair I will tell you the truth. When I first went to Israel, it was in the old days when they had a crummy old airport, and you had to you walk downstairs to get to the tarmac, and then you slept along the tarmac to get into a to a third world airport. And I remember going down the stairs with my kids, and I wanted to get on my hands and knees and kiss the tarmac. Because I knew that's what Jews had done. And I was embarrassed to do it. And some people have said to me, well, you, you can go to Israel many times. You can only go once. Or you can only go the first time once. And that first time, I regret that I didn't stop and acknowledge this love affair with the land of Israel. We've had this love affair going for so very, very long. Um, we go to Israel not as tourists. We go to Israel as pilgrims. We want to have a sense that the Jewish is there, our story is there. That's what we want. Don't you remember when Herzl was given the opportunity of having a Jewish homeland in some other place in Africa, Kenya, Uganda, right? He was going to take it. But the Jews who really needed Israel said, Are you crazy? We can only go back to the, our land. We talk about Israel as the land, the holy land. 
the rabbis understood that there are degrees of holiness, and they, they kind of drew a map of holiness in which there's a center of holiness, which is the temple. In fact, the Holy of Holies, the middle of the temple, where only the high priest gets to go. And then so the lesser degree of holiness all the way along, lesser degree of holiness on the Temple Mount, lesser degree of holiness in Jerusalem itself, little less on the in Eretz Israel, but once you hit the boundary, that's it, folks. They had the notion in that there's something called holy. And just to be there in the land was to be holy. We've now generalized, they generalized that, of course, after the temple was gone and said, it's not a synagogue. So the synagogue, you know, is like the temple. But nonetheless, Israel is Israel, and back at home in a way. I talked to my Catholic friends at Notre Dame. I said, don't you want to go to the Vatican? They say, what for? They say, well, no, that's the center of your religion. They say, yeah, but it's not the same. The government sends an alert when a child is alert. Amber alert. All right. Um, they're not interested in going to the wrong. I have Lutheran friends. I say, hey, you know what? 1517 is when Martin Luther had the CCs. Right. In 2017, 500 years, you want to go visit the church? Before. They don't have the same status. Now, we're not the only religion that has landedness. Native peoples have landedness. Right? So here in Canada, you acknowledge Native peoples, the indigenous peoples who are here. They have landedness, and there are other people who do. I'm not saying this is only Jewish, but it is Jewish. And I'm interested in what happens when you have a sense of landedness. Well, throughout Jewish history, then, there is this notion that this land is holy, and you get something by going to visit it, and that's how you are Jewish. But the most important thing about landedness, as I see it, is the following. Because of our experience of having a land, but not living in it, and because for most of the time, not living in it was not the happiest thing in the world. But even when it was happy, it's not the holy part. You still get there to get your, your inoculation of, say, nowadays of holiness, right? They had a sense of the difference between being at home in the homeland and being in exile. Now, I'm later saying, I don't think I'm in exile in Canada. Don't get me wrong. But it's like a metaphysical construct. There's a difference between being at home and being in exile. The Kabbalah took that metaphysical difference and applied it to human life. And with other brilliance, they said the human condition is to want to be at home, but regularly to feel that you are in exile. You feel like you're in exile if you feel you don't have a home. Feel like you're in exile is to feel you don't belong here. How many parties have you gone to if you wondered, oh, will I know anybody? You stand at the doorway and there are all these tables and you say, what am I doing here? I'm in the state. Do they really want me? I mean, that's what it is to be human, isn't it? And yet sometimes you feel welcome and you say, ah, oh, now I'm at home. So the Jewish ethic, then, out of the sense of spirituality, of having a home, but also knowing that you live other places, the Jewish ethic is to say, you know, home matters. And therefore, homelessness matters. I would like to say, therefore, that homelessness is a uniquely Jewish concern. I actually think Palestinians should have a home. Whether it'll work out, I don't know. But that's because I think everybody deserves a home. Every people deserves a home. And I think every person deserves a home. And so for a Jew especially, to see homeless people is to know what it was like to wander and be in exile. So part of then Jewish spirituality 
is to realize that we know what it is to wander and to be in exile, and we know what it is to have a home, and we are committed as Jews in ways I think that other people are not to solving the problem of homelessness, both globally and individually in, in our community. Now I want to look, into, look with you at the calendar. There's a Jewish concept of time. I mean, we tend to think time is just time. You know, time is okay. But time is what we never have enough of, that we know. Right? That's actually profound. We don't know. It's one thing that you will run out of eventually. But what time is, physics, physicians, physicists don't know. I mean, I, I talk to several physicists and I say, what is time? And they say, oh, well, that's already a problem. <laughs> and I think, for you, it's a problem also? So they don't know yet, I don't know either. I'm told that the physics of time, the, the equations of time that, make, that explain time, actually run both ways. There's no way, there's no reason from the, physics, from the mathematics of it that time couldn't run backwards, just as easily. This I memorized to tell you, I have no idea your dead <laughs> I mean, just think of it, what is time? So we human beings are in time, we know we run out of time, we think that time is sort of like a video that passes us and now it's gone, but so you know what tomorrow is and you know what, 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 what yesterday was, but you don't know what now is because we don't know now, because the minute it's now, it's past. I mean, you can drive yourself in the show game with all of this. <laughs> I like doing that, actually. <laughs> but I do know that we human beings have to come to terms with the time is because we have to live in time. So we develop these arbitrary things called calendars. I now invite you to think about the ordinary calendar that you use. Now, nowadays, it's all on your phone. Anybody who is under 40 or something won't get this, I understand. But once upon a time, you used to use things called calendars made out of paper. And you've got little booklets that you put in your in your pocketbook or in your, your pocket. And these were your calendars for the year, whatever the year happened to be. We then should have had in December because you were have to make appointments in there. Right? Now um, I want you to think about a picture of these that you know what I'm talking about? I'm not the only one, right? Then you still have these things. Oh good. All right, thank God. All right. So I want you to so think about what these ordinary calendars used to buy them in stores. That's another thing they used to have called stores. So I want you to think about what it, what it was like. You buy this calendar for $15 or something and you open it up. What is in it? Nothing. You spend $15 on an empty book. But actually, you see it's divided into two pages, like double pages. And each double page is a week. And so you discover time is made of things called weeks. That's the basic element of time. And you discover that actually the week is made of six and a half days, because one of those spaces is only <laughs> half the size of the other. Right? Now, the purpose of buying the book is to fill it up. The person who dies with the most books still wins. <laughs> The worst thing is if someone says, gee, can we make an appointment? And you say, yeah, I'm going to do that. Week. I get nothing. <laughs> Never mind, I don't want to meet you. I mean, what kind of person are you? Not that appointments. Not that appointments. So when the right answer is, well, I think I can fit you in. I don't know. Let's look and see. Maybe Tuesday at noon. I don't know. Wednesday at 3. Couldn't do 3. 30. And you have this little negotiation, as if it's for, you know, the bridges of the kingdom or something like that. And finally, you put somebody in. Now, at the end of the day, you kept very busy with the appointments. It's a success. You filled up your time. Right? By contrast, I give you the Jewish calendar. Do you have any of these, like, paper Jewish calendars? You still get them like for free? That's the first thing you notice, right? No. They're lucky if you take it. 
some class of fifteen dollars. Now these are big counties, right? And um, they're usually given up like by funeral homes and kosher butchers and things like that. Right? And you put them on the wall. You couldn't fit this in your pocket. I mean, you know, it's on the wall. You look at it. At first glance, it would occur to you that the purpose of the Jewish calendar is to give poor artists a place to display their work. So now you begin putting your appointments in the bottom hat. And guess what? You can't do it. There's no room. It comes loaded. It's already full. First, you'll notice, and you notice a lot of these calendars. First, you'll discover that uh, one row of things is in red. This is obviously the important day. Then you discover that's the only day with a name, Shabbat. The other days are Yom Rishon, Yom Shani, Yom Boring, 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 but Shabbat. Then they can really study it and discover the day before Shabbat is called, right, it's called Er Shabbat. And the day after is called Mosa Eight Shabbat. Obviously, the purpose of the calendar is to get to the red part, to get to Shabbat. And already by Friday, you're on the way. Sunday, no, you never, because the day afterward, you got to start thinking about real life. But the whole purpose of the calendar is to differentiate time. And the time is, as I say, already determined. And in fact, it comes with so many things on it. There's no room already for your friends and for your appointees. I mean, I don't know what happens when you know, like job scandals and what the center is, and this is a holiday you've ever heard of before. Here's a fast day, nobody keeps, but that's all there. <laughs> Deeper though than the calendar, as you see it on the wall, is what the calendar really does tell you. The purpose of the week is not to make appointments so that you are busy and therefore you become important. The purpose of the week is to get rid of the appointments and that's the day when you don't have it. Human life is not about making appointments. Human life is about getting to Shabbat. And experiencing what Shabbat is with your friends, with your family, with guests, and having an owner of Shabbat, joy of Shabbat. That's what the center of life is all about. Then you even discover that there are other red things on the calendar. The beginning of each month, that's important too. Now you find that it's called something called Rosh Chodesh. Now, interestingly enough, Rosh Chodesh is, is like a little new year. Rosh Hashanah is just the most important Rosh Chodesh, that's all. So the beginning of each month is like a Rosh Hashanah, little one. You can start all over again every month. How's that for an idea? On every Rosh Hodesh, you can say, well, this month is awful. I'm beginning again. Just like I'm Rosh, I'm, I'm, I'm Rosh Hashanah. You say, next year it should be a good year. Should be a good month. Do you know in the Middle Ages, like the eighth, ninth century in Israel, they said they said a kiddush on Rosh Chodesh, just like they do on the other holidays. It was that important. So now what you see about the Jewish year is it's geared to the human condition. It's an opportunity to be renewed. It's an opportunity not to lose yourself in one day being the same as the next appointment, and so on and so forth. And Time has a flavor. We all know this if we keep the Jewish calendar. The month before Rosh Hashanah is different, isn't it? It's not the same as say the month before Pesach. There's a different feel about that. And now we have new holidays. What's the night? Not a holiday we like. <laughs> But a day to remember in Jewish history. In your mosque mode, all you do about So our calendar encourages you not to take time as something empty that you fill up. It encourages you instead to see time as something that already has a flavor and you can fit yourself into it. And that flavor was formulated by our ancestors who had a sense over time, over centuries, of what the Jewish condition is. You live with the Jewish calendar and you know the Jewish condition. You want to be a great person, a wonderful person? I'll tell you how you can do it. Do you think we know how to give thanks automatically? No. Do you think we know how to grieve automatically? We do not. 
Do you think we know how to how to do anything automatic? We have to learn that. These are human responses that we learn. I'll tell you how you can learn them by keeping the calendar. If you keep the calendar, you know what it is to grieve when you get to a holiday to a terrible day, right? Right? You almost show up. Or once upon a time, Kishabah, not so much for us. You want to know how to be grateful? There's no sukkah for a while. How to be with friends and family, sit around a Seder table. How to realize that it's better to give a chance for who you are. Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur. I could go on and on. Just joy, ordinary joy. You want to know joy? How about dancing with the Torah? I'm saying, Hat Torah. Or if you're an adult and you'd like to recover your childhood, I recommend Torah. In other words, the holidays were built with human condition in mind, so that every year is the human condition writ large. The Jewish calendar is spiritual, if we live it to the full. I have two more examples. First of all, I have to talk about the spirituality of night. It occurred to me at some point that spirituality can't all be a rapturous. Because most of human life is not rapturous. There are ups and there are downs. Is there then a kind of spirituality that we can re recommend to people in times of illness, grief, difficulty? The problem with those conditions, obviously, is that actually it's about are wanting to make meaning about them. Somebody dies, and you want to say, why did this happen? What's the meaning to it? What, what, why? Someone gets sick, you say, why is my son ill? How could that be? Why, why so young? Why, why, why? You want a meaning, you want a reason for it. What has to be meaning? So you want to think about what is meaning? Does everything have to have meaning, I ask you? Do you think there's meaning in everything? There's a guy by the name of Stanley Fish, he's a great professor of English literature. And Fish um, tells us in one of his books that he went into the classroom and he started to rub off the board, you know, where somebody had written notes before him, and he got called away halfway through writing off, rubbing off the blackboard. So he goes up in the hall to have a little meeting, comes back in, the students are sitting there and they're writing down what's on the board, thinking that this is his summary of his lecture. It's me, it's the first, it's the first word of five sentences. So he says, what did you write down? They tell him, they're very proud. And they say, what do you think this is all about? And they make up a lecture of it. You could find meaning in anything. But the meaning wasn't really there. It had nothing to do with what he had to say. Another example, Annie Dillard, one of the greatest authors in my, uh, my imagination right now, Annie Gillard recalls an artist, I forget which artist it was, I'm sorry. She recalls an artist who she wants to know, because she's writing fiction, what are the limits of fiction? And she recalls an artist who wants to know what are the limits of painting? So this artist says, what if I paint a bird cage? So far so good, right? What if I paint a bird cage with no bird in it? How about if I paint a bird cage with no bird in it, doors open? Clever. What if I do a bird cage with a cat in the cage? What if I did a bird cage with a running through it? A what? Secret? That's why you run out of meat. She says that's the deal. At some point, things don't hold together. There's no meaning. Some things just don't make sense. My son Joel, a lot of you here know him. When he was a little boy, he insisted on asking why. An anthropologist did studies of this with other people, found out that in working class families in Great Britain, when kids ask why, they answer the slot across the face, shut up, that's it. Not us to do not ask why. And so the greatest joy is when your child asks you why. Keep on asking why. Eventually, I say to my son, because I was swatting, I say, Joel, there's no why. Sometimes there's no why. Sometimes there is just no meaning. Now, Judaism struggled with this. 
In the Bible, you'll find Deuteronomy saying that the reason people suffer is that the community has done wrong. So you might be okay, but you belong to the community. So tough, they sin, you're gonna suffer. We get to Ezekiel, one of the prophets, and he says, oh no, no, not the community, but you did something wrong, you now have to suffer. You did something wrong, that's it. But the rabbis did this amazing thing, they put together the Bible and they put in this book called Job. A story about a man who was absolutely righteous and suffered terribly. And he has these friends who come to tell him, well, you must have done something wrong. I will tell you the why. And Job insists, no, not me. I don't know why. Archibald McKee wrote a great play, J.P., based on Job. And he has Job say to his comforter, who comes and tells him, you must have done something wrong. He comes and he says to him, Yours is the great, yours is the cruelest comfort of all. To insist that there must be a reason for this. There's no why. So let's start by acknowledging there's no why. We don't understand these things. It's part of the human condition and that's it. So now let's start all over again. What we can see about illness and about, about mourning is that it draws us to the people as visitors. Um, somebody described illness in terms of a passport. When you're born, you're given two passports. A passport of the well and a passport of the sick. And you use the one of the well and you say about the passport of the sick, I'll never need to put it away. Until someday, you discover you need to take out that passport. And so to be sick is to be living under another passport in a different country called the land of the sick. People who are well cross the border and they come to visit you. The sicker you get, the less they understand of your condition. They are not able to say anymore, it'll get better, because you won't. They don't know what pain you're feeling. What do you say to somebody? Judaism asks this question. How do you visit the sick? One of the most profound teachings I know comes from the medieval law code called the Tour, which is based upon 13th century, that's based on the Talmud. And they talk about what you do when you visit. And they picture you standing, visiting somebody in the hospital or in bed. They virtually ignore prayer. They don't say, oh, come and pray with me. Maimonides doesn't even talk about it. He's a physician. He has a feeling that prayer is not what we do best at this time. And so Maimonides and in this later law code, they say, the first thing you do is you make people as comfortable as possible. Get rid of the dust in the room, puff up the pillow, do whatever you can just to help someone who suffers have at least a little bit of comfort. Then comes the most profound, the most amazing, the most incredible teaching. Where do you sit? The Talmud says that when you are sick, God sits on the pillow beside you. Imagine, God is there. But if you think about it, if you're sick, run down, because on the pillow, you won't notice God, right? I mean, you don't look around. And so where do you sit? We sit at the other end of the bed, foot of the bed. What the person can see is not God directly, but can see God in us. And our job is just to let God be reflected in our being there. And just be there. Let's go to the mirror made in God's image. We're the closest the person can get at that stage. The spirituality of this sick man is to give up our figuring on why and spend our time instead. Visiting those who are sick, so as the Talmud says elsewhere, they will visit you the way you visit them. And realize that it is in our power to bring the presence of God, the presence of the eternity to these people. Well, last, I want to spend a few minutes on 
that it was going on. Because that's what Mark did. He was a teacher of Torah. And there's something about Torah that we all know is central to us. The spirituality of Torah though, is a little hard to get at. First, we just take it for granted. But in fact, if you really study it deeply, you, you know how you can get caught up in it. Why do you go to Torah study? Your eyes light up and you come home and you say, guess what he said today? And she was sitting next to me and said, you know, the, the, the real life rock and said this and that. I can't believe it. Quoting Rashi. Yeah. And somebody else. There are these people called the Tosafot who wrote in the Middle Ages. They were, they were like Galastics. They took different pieces of polish that didn't agree with one another, and then they figured out they had to agree by what did, you know? Do you know what? That's Jewish poetry. It's beautiful to see how they put it all together to solve a problem that has no possible purpose except to enjoy the intellectual ability of solving a problem. That too can be spiritual. But I want to think differently about it. You can go a little deeper. Our problem is that, you know, we, we divide the Bible into parts, which is good. But then we end up with Torah by itself. And that's excellent. But then we divide each sedra. And we forget the sedras are part of the longer train of you know the entire Torah. What if we look at the study of Torah as a whole? We just like to work our way from Bereshi at the beginning to the end of the Bari, the end of Deuteronomy at the end. We will have gone through five books of Torah. And I want to say to you, these five books of Torah are equivalent to the five stages of a human life. We go through life going ourselves from book to book to book. So look quickly at Genesis with me. Genesis, after all, is about what? It's about children, mostly trying to kill each other. Just like real life, when you were a kid with your brothers and sisters. I mean, none of these kids have it easy, my God. Think about, think about, I don't know, first two kids are Cain and Abel, one kills the next one, and you're on your way. The issue is just redundant. Or think about uh, poor Joseph. Brother Solomon is slavery. He has to live on his own in a strange planet. But Jacob and Esau, there's another famous couple. The story of Genesis also is about it's hard to have children. None of our ancestors became pregnant easily. So it's about that period in life, even before you're born, whether you will be. And then you come out of the womb. What is it like to be a real kid? Not easy. At the end of Genesis, though, the last thing, your father, I, I Jacob, with his children gathered around the bed. What does he do? He gives them blessings. Each one their own blessing. I don't know if you've read the blessings. Two of them are blessings you can do without. And that too is life, isn't it? If you're lucky, you would come out of childhood with a real blessing from your parents. If you're not, then you might have a blessing that isn't so good. And so you have to make your way in the world without it. It's real. These are real people. So you get to the next book, Exodus. First said is Shemot, names. This is a period when you're an adolescent, teenager, right? A young person. Um, and you're making a name for yourself. These are the names. What's your name? What will your name be? The name you make, not the name they gave you. And it's coming of age. So first, you got to leave Egypt. You're going to leave your parents' home. I don't know, too much of it. You're on death and slavery, maybe. But you do have to leave your parents' home. And you got to find your way in the, in, into a new world. It's a wilderness. And so you march through, through sometimes doubting yourself. Just the way the Israelites do. I want to go home again. No, you can make it. I want to go home. No, it's okay. You'll find your way. 
And then finally you grow up, and so you grow up at the end of it, at the end of, of Exodus. And what do you learn? Two big things in Exodus are first of all, you find responsibility because you stand at Sinai. And that's what you learn when you're finally at the end of this era of stuff going up, you're a young person. Responsibility. You're not responsible. Second thing you settle down. You build a home. And that's the second thing they do. They build a home. And they want God to be in it. So it's God's home as well. It's Mishkan. Those two things then are what mark a young person's life. Responsibility, independence, and building your own home. And now you're on to the middle book of, of, of the Torah, of Leviticus. And that's a little later in life. After you've grown up, maybe you have a family, you have a job, you've been doing it for a while, right? Interestingly enough, that book is called Vayikra, God Called. This is your calling. The word calling is something you don't use very much, but we all have a calling. The calling is to do whatever you're supposed to do to find yourself. It could be as a mother with four kids. It could be as somebody who's got a job and loves it dearly. It could be both. But we struggle to find out who am I? And in this third part of life, you, you're finding yourself and you're going to work and now you're building your career and now you're busy with kids and you're balancing all kinds of things. What is Leviticus about then? Mostly it's about sacrifice. Because that's what you do as an adult with responsibility where you have other people dependent upon you. And so this is an exercise of most of our life, that middle three of our life, right? Where we sacrifice. And it's not just a sacrifice that you see there, but also you see the nitty gritty of it. It's about menstruation. It's about having children. I don't mean the, oh, how beautiful part. I mean, having children. What you see there is about getting sick. And they get the doctor, the priest comes and says, well, I'm sure maybe there's something wrong with the house. You got fumigated. I don't know. Should you put out of the camp? How bad is it? That's what that part of life is like. Your kids are getting sick all the time. You want to be at work and you don't know what to do with them and how sick are they and what do they have to do. This is your day by day life. Vayikra, which is the middle book of Torah, was put there for a reason. Vayikra is the book where nothing happens. They could have put it anywhere. Rabbis who preach all the time wish sometimes they had put it somewhere else. We're stuck with it in the middle. Because that's about real, real life. Because most of our life's about real, real life. But if you get through that period, you get to the fourth book, which is the book of Numbers or Bamibar in the wilderness. This, my friends, is called the midlife crisis. You get to the point in life, you really do, where you discover all that stuff you were learning in Vayetra, you're good at it now. You can do it with one hand tied behind your back. The kids are now moving out anyway. They don't need you so much anymore. And as for your job, you're not going to become president. This is as hard as you're going to get. You got the office in the middle of the third floor. And people pass you by, and you're a fixture. You may notice, by the way, people don't pay too much attention to you at this stage. I mean, your kids are having kids, maybe. You remember the days when they used to give up birthday parties? Now, if they remember your birthday, that's good. Because they give you a birthday party, they're not quite sure how old you are, actually. But they put one candle on, it's good enough. <laughs> you remember when, it had you, when you were a kid, they told you stories of your first step, your first, your, your first word is written down somewhere. Maybe when you were a teenager, your first day, your first kiss, first day of college, all these things. There's no more firsts anymore. Everything is 190 seconds to 350 seconds, and you've lost track. And you're wondering at this stage, I can do it all easily, but look, it's healthy, I'm good. Now what? We all go through that stage of wondering, and now what? I'm good at what I do. Uh, there are studies of this midlife crisis, supposed to happen when you're about 40. Nowadays, I don't know if that's still the same number, um, but you know, the Israelites have lasted 40 years. So 40, 40. On the other hand, thank God it doesn't last 40 years. And thank God you come out of it. And if you come out of it, and if you are fortunate to help with 
just get it through life with the struggle of that midwife when you say to yourself this is all i've got you will get to Devari. you'll get to deuteronomy deuteronomy is hebrew is Devari words in the psalms it says it says take with you words and take them to god deuteronomy is when you get to old age and you know you're going to see god around the corner now maybe <laughs> Not sure how many years you have left anymore. And you get the chance to do what Moses did in Deuteronomy. You get to go over your life. Remember how Moses thinks about everything he did in Deuteronomy? But he makes some changes. He didn't like the Ten Commandments 100%. He changes them by the time you get to, to Deuteronomy, right? According to the Midrash, he says goodbye to all the Israelites. He goes camp by camp, tent by tent. He goes divide that. He prepares words. He prepares the God. And the amazing thing is, he gets to the point where he's ready to die. So that last great scene, he's on peace God on the top of the mountain. He's looking at, at the world, at, the, the, at where he wants to go, you know, the promised land, and he knows he's not going to get there. Because that's what we discover when we get old. We will never get to the promised land. Whatever the promised land is, it's pushed off into the future. So all we know is that other people who influenced, maybe our children, maybe our nephews, maybe our nieces, maybe grandchildren, maybe the kid next door, maybe what we hear, people read our works or people hear what we have to say, and they remember us, like we're remembering tonight. And that becomes your legacy. And so you get to the point that Moses did, knowing he had a legacy. He had Joshua. We all have Joshua. Mark Shapiro has Joshua, and all of us who are listening and thinking about him and what he taught. And that's how we get ready to die. Tragically, it can happen too soon. If we're fortunate, we get some time to think about it. And if we're lucky, we die the way Moses did. That's how I want to die. Whether it all get to it, I don't know. According to the Midrash, he dies with a kiss from God. Not a bad way to go. But at least with the sense that life is worthwhile. And that I've left something better in the world after I'm gone. I have done what I was here to do. That then is the deep spirituality of Torah. To realize that when we read it each year, we can remember when we were in that book. We can look ahead and I'm going to be there later. We can think about what it is to be. What book are you in now? This is the story of our lives writ large. All these ways of thinking about Jewish spirituality are like a child thing. You probably did this once when you were sick. I don't know if they still use books. But when I was a kid, they gave you workbooks. And you got this thick workbook with a pencil. It wasn't a program. The programs will work just as well. But one of the things that you can do in the books or the program is you could connect the dog. Kids love that. How come at the end of the first page they don't say I did this already? I don't want to know. They love connecting the dots. It is because that is their preparation for the world. Connect the dots is what we will do for the rest of our lives. Not dots on a page that just were all messy and comes out of picture, but dots of our life. We come across the horizon. Some of them we plan for and the dot arrives. Sometimes these are dots that just show up against our will. But dots, dots, dots. And we try to connect them throughout life. What's my life all about? What is what, now what? Where do I go? Who am I? What's my story? It's connecting the dots. So to connect the dots as a kid is the preparation for the real dots that you'll get in life. It's a lot harder to connect them as an adult, these real dots, because they don't come numbered. You have to decide which dots matter and which dots don't. I believe, in the depth of my being, that to be intentional about your practice, to realize what's under the surface, it's a Jewish exercise of connecting the dots of the human life. Torah matters. 
as Mark would have taught us, because Torah has to do with life. So I give you some samples of Jewish spirituality in the hope that you will use them, find them helpful in this great human enterprise that we are all stuck with, but what a gift it is, and connect the dots of our lives and know that we will matter. Thank you. So question. I took too long on the story. I'm not in practice all those years of COVID, you know. Um, but I'm happy to take some questions on that. You're saying there might be some questions on, on Zoom. So uh, you're going to help me if that's the case. And we'll just take 10 minutes or so, but I'm happy to work with you able to sign on. I have a question. Um, it's I think it's a question about marketing mm -hmm. because your answer tonight is Torah, mitzvot, calendar. It's not all very sexy. I agree with you that that is the the root of Jewish spirituality. But how do you think we can um, encourage <laughs> more people to tap into it? We wish you'd ask a difficult question. Yeah. I should ask you because this is what you do all the time. Is this still, still on? Um, I, I think this goes to a larger issue. And it may not be relevant to this synagogue and it may not be, I, I don't know. Um, when I come here, I, I see an enormously exciting place where you do more things than I can imagine where we walk on the outside, we point to the places where you eat food. We come inside and we see this high uh, um, um exhibit. exhibit. Um, I know you have a minion tomorrow morning. I know all of this. And I see so many things that are going on. So I think the answer first and foremost is just to run a great synagogue, which you do. I visit synagogues all over the country. I know how you too, I know people do that too. Um, Sometimes what happens is we forget about, sometimes we, the synagogue from the outside looks like a bastion where nobody can get in. And sometimes I observe that we do things so well, but we forget that we need, a, we need an easy entry ramp. So whenever I go places, for example, people say to me, oh, it's a, we have a great tourist idea. You gotta see a Sabbath morning, you'll see. I go, it's a great Torah study. And then I say, how many of these people have been coming forever? They say, everybody. And I say, how come there's no new people? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, I don't know exactly. You know? So one of the issues is that uh, people who do things together become a click, whether they know it or not. And it's really hard for a new person to feel comfortable. The second issue is that people come, people are looking for spirituality, I can see. But um, not always in a Jewish mode. They no longer, they may not have Jewish background at all. Most synagogues, 50% of the people now are, who join, who are interested or part of the synagogue, are people who were not raised Jewish in any way, shape, or form. So we're, it's a different kind of population. And I know that we're still trying to figure out what to do with the, obviously the next generation, which was in every old generation says about the next generation. <laughs> but, but, but. But there are issues of the way people think about the world. So I think, I, I, I don't know an answer. If I had an easy answer, you know, I would uh, just give it to you. And you ask. But I do think the following. I think that, the, that we've gone through several stages of synagogue in North America. Uh, Canada is a little different than, than the States, as you know. But speaking of North America in general, we went through a stage of the time when synagogues were founded. Then we entered stage in the 1950s and 50s, particularly when synagogues were very, very popular. It was a thing to go to church. People went to synagogue. And then we went through the period of the 1990s where you mentioned synagogue 2000, Larry mentioned synagogue 2000. And I was convinced that synagogues needed, needed to rethink themselves, how they reach people and what they're all about and so on. And I think that's happened again. Um, I, I, um, 
There's an old story that every, our prayer book gets renewed every 20 years, something like that. Either it gets revised or something like that. So I think the synagogues like prayer books. Every 20 years, they should have a revolution. They should, you know, start doing things differently and thinking differently. Um, and I think that revolution is just something that we're about to start. We've reached the point where we see we can't just keep going on like this, even the great synagogue like you have here, though. Seems to me you to just find and keep on going. But, but in general, synagogues need to rethink themselves. I know that's happening also with, with uh, churches. The working? Yeah. I know that's happening also with churches. So I think of this as a, like, broad, we're in an era of the new reformation. The reformation when, when religion has to rethink itself. Religion is alive and well in the state, certainly, with regard to the extreme right. But that doesn't mean that we can't have a voice, too. You gave me some examples of it when you talked about the relationship or like the Robert did but with the Muslim community and so on. So I think what we need to do is just restructure. We think our synagogues from the bottom up. And eventually, I think we'll figure it out. I don't have an answer for it, but I want to understand the problem. I think it's very serious, but I, I'm very optimistic that we can do it. I do know this. I said to you in the way in, we don't have synagogues, we won't have Judaism. Those who think we can do without synagogues are crazy. You, there doesn't take a great a, a PhD in sociology to realize that every great idea, every great thing has to be institutionalized for it to continue. And so if we have no institution for Judaism, if people just kind of do a little bit Jewish here and there and everywhere, which is kind of what we hear being touted, uh, we will have no future. We need synagogues desperately. Thank you. Yeah. So we have a question from the room at home from Janet. Um, she says that spirituality has to do with our soul and with connecting to God. How can we, on a soul level, hear God speak to us individually um, rather than just going to the book? So, so how can we really cultivate that connection with love and words of God speaking to us individually? How do we hear God's voice individually? Well, um, I won't presume to know all the ways, but I'll tell you the way I my way. I, I'm in love with the prayer book, I like study, and uh, uh, I think about, maybe I'll just make this at this late, I'll make this the last answer. Um, when I think about prayer, um, we could have talked about this all night too. Why should we pray? What can we expect out of prayer and all that sort of thing, right? So I think of the prayer service as a masterful our piece of art. It, it's it's like best one thing I think to an opera because the music is a thing. Um, but the drama has to be there. And it has to have the flaw, it has to flow. And you can't just read a whole bunch of prayers and, you know, like oh one more page, how many pages to go, right? Uh, you, it has to have a plot line and it has to be, a, it's like a great film, right? The director here. Right? Great film, produced it here. So I think services have to be looked at that way. Now, if you have services that are a flow to them with great music and a great message by, by the rabbi who's giving a sermon and it, it touches your life deeply, and if in fact you feel the satisfaction that you come at, at the end of it, I think you can really have a sense, first of all, that God is there. But in addition now, how do I speak God specifically? Sometimes I go to services and I just get lost in the line. My most amazing moments are opening myself to the, to the message and opening myself to the experience. And there are moments that I couldn't predict when I suddenly have the sense that God is present and that somehow or other this is a moment of God. And I, it, it, it's time out of time for me. It's come from music, and it comes, I say, in a given line, and I'll emphasize this a lot. So I know the prayer book almost by heart. Me, I know, I know that line. But if I focus on the words, every once in a while, I'll see a line, and I'll think, that's it, that's speaking to me. And I get lost in that line, that that's the voice of God, that one line. And the rest of the service almost makes little difference. 
So I advise people who are not comfortable with prayer book and they don't want to pray and so on and so forth. And until we have a perfect prayer service where, you know, you can't help but get carried away. And sometimes you do. By the way, I have had that here, by the way. It's a be- one of the beautiful things you do is the service. Uh, I mean, incredibly beautiful. But elsewhere, let's say, where they don't, I can still focus a line by line. And it's like any line can bring me beneath the surface, below the iceberg. Just at that moment, I say, that's what I'm thinking about. That's what I want. I'll give you one of the quick, quick example. And that quick example is from uh, um, once I had broken my leg and broken a hip and I was in rehab and I wasn't allowed to walk for six, six, eight weeks or something, couldn't put any weight on my on my hip, put it all. And I, they weren't sure I'd ever be able to walk again. They said, be careful, be careful. And I finally got to the crutches and I they. So finally I could at least drive with the crutches. And my son, Joel, was giving a lecture somewhere in the area. I said, well, I'm going to go here, Mike. And I slept with the crutches, and I drove to Connecticut, and I heard there I go to services, and I'm feeling miserable, and it's painful, and everything. And he gets to the line of Hoshki Vainu. Hoshki Vainu of Nihilahe. Lie us down with God in peace. And raise us up. Hami Vainu Chayi in life. I remember hearing that I knew the Hebrew, so they were singing it, but you could read it. I remember thinking to myself, yes, that's what I need tonight. That's what I want. I can do this. I I can go to sleep tonight in peace for the first time. And I, I will have get up and I will have life again. It was a, a changer in my life. I think that that can happen to some regularity. If you pay attention to service and music speak to you, a certain given, given line to jump out at you and become your line. And the rest of the service almost doesn't matter at that point. And I, I think that's the voice of God that, that speaks to the two kids. Well, I want to thank you again for inviting me. Say again what an honor it is to be tonight, Martha, to be here. Larry, thanks for your overly generous uh, introduction. Mm-hmm. And uh, I feel at home with you, and I love being here. Thank you, thank you. Liberal Jewish life everywhere has been shaped by Rabbi Professor Larry Hoffman, and that is also true about us here at Holy Blossom Temple. In ways that you might not even be aware of, our Sidur Pirchei Kodesh, for example, is enriched by your scholarship, and you gave us permission to include one of your essays in our prayer book, and you were generous in proofreading and giving a bit of feedback when it was in production. When we go on a congregational trip to Israel, we take with us Rabbi Hoffman's uh, book about how to say brachot along the way. And when we launched an initiative called HB Together to make this large congregation feel smaller and more intimate and more engaging, we did so with the help of Rabbi Hoffman's book, Relational Judaism. So Holy Blossom has been shaped by you in countless and measureless ways. Um, You teach us how to do Jewish more deeply, more thoughtfully, more intentionally. And for that, we are very grateful to you. Uh, You spoke about a bracha that you say when you see royalty and Rabbi Englander referred to as a luminary. So what is the bracha that we say when we are in the presence of a luminary of our time? Baruch atah Adonai, Yotzer HaMeorot. Praised are you, O God, creator of the universe who has created a luminary in our own time. And together we can all say, yes. So I want to um, come back to Rabbi Mark Dov Shapiro's good name and his good memory. He treasured lifelong learning and he treasured lifelong friends. And 
his favorite thing, one of his favorite things, was to combine the two, learning with friends. And it's thanks to his memory and the generosity of friends and family and congregants and colleagues that we're able to combine uh, learning and friendship tonight. May his memory forever be a blessing. To you, Marsha, to Dan, who is with us through the live stream, and uh, to all who loved him and all who learned from him and were enriched by his leadership. Everyone is welcome to linger a little while. I think there is coffee and maybe a cookie around. I think so, yes. Mm -hmm. um, I want to thank Sharoni Sibony for running tech tonight, but also for helping to prepare for uh, Rabbi Hoffman's visit. And I want to thank Dante Thorne for um, setting up the, the room and for the cookie <laughs> that's, that's waiting somewhere. Thank you, Dante. Um, the coming weeks are very full. It's a very uh, busy program season. There are concerts, there are lectures. Rabbi Danielle Hartman is coming from Jerusalem in a couple of weeks. Rabbi Sam Kay's mini course, Machloket Matters, about Jewish debate is coming up. And the installation of Rabbi Eliza McCarroll is going to be on the first Shabbat of December. And Rabbi Karen Tomasho will be returning to be our teacher in honor of Rabbi McCarroll that Shabbat. So please check the website and um, enjoy all of the upcoming opportunities for learning. And with that, I wish you a good evening. Thanks for coming, everybody.